really, really interesting set of topics, everything from technology to applications. You'll hear about a utility, uh, two utilities, and how we see the opportunities around hydrogen. You'll hear from people such as Toyota talking about applications, um, how cities can um, how cities can relate and how research, power to gas. There's just a really wide range of very interesting and exciting topics for us to start exploring. Even the conversations outside, some of us started to talk about how we can work together to facilitate things that both benefit the environment, both benefit the environment, become economic, and also help resiliency in the Northwest, which is another critical piece to what we're looking at. So, Thank you for coming. I'd like to thank Dan Whalen in particular for helping put this together um, with Ken. Where's Ken? Ken, right here. Um, and also, right here. Um, and also with Jason Huser. Thanks for pointing this together. It came together very quickly, so if you got an invite yesterday, you were not alone. <laughs> um, and so, thank you for that. With that, I won't take any more time. Let's get into the discussion. I'd like to pass it off to uh, Congressman Peter DeFazio. Peter, thank you. Um, yep, do I on. tap it there? Nope. Is it on? Oh, yep. it's on. Great. Okay. No little lights. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here, and thanks uh, to the panel. Uh, I'm not the expert, but uh, I uh, am looking to be instructed for my committee's uh, duties uh, in terms of ways we can uh, better utilize uh, renewable uh, technologies. Uh, more, it was probably 15 years ago a guy named Jack Robertson, uh, who was Deputy Administrator BPA, came to me with, at the time, I guess, a, a very visionary idea. He said, you know, on the back of the clock, in the morning, sometimes we're giving away electricity. Uh, and in fact, in some cases, they were paying people to take it. Uh, and he says, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And he came up with a plan to have uh, you know, moving uh, and, and building near each of the dams uh, for about here today, uh, and because it, it's an energy intensive process, although it's now become less energy intensive thanks to uh, what we see uh, out there right now and more efficient, uh, less expensive. And his idea was to create uh, ammonia fuels. Uh, and, um, you know, this was a very interesting idea. After President Obama, obviously the Bush administration wasn't interested, but after Obama got elected, I went to Secretary Moniz and I said, you know, this guy has these ideas, and to me it's, and so I put him in touch with Moniz, and, you know, we've made a little progress since then. There is a small DOE program uh, applying for a grant here uh, on this small DOE program uh, applying for a grant here. Uh, on this, it should be a much more ambitious program. But the idea is if you have renewable energy uh, and um, you can crack water with it, you're creating a totally sustainable fuel. This car is a beautiful car we're out there with the hydrogen. Car is a beautiful car we're out there with the hydrogen fuel cell. I was just in it. Uh, right now, generally, the only uh, source of hydrogen available is fossil fuel derived. But there's a potential that we could have sustainable hydrogen in the future, and of course, the total product of burning the hydrogen is a little water vapor, uh, which, you know, here in the Northwest, we don't. Uh, that's, uh, that's why we're here today, and I'm here to learn, and uh, that's enough for me, because these people are going to be uh, much more in-depth on the potential and possibilities here with eWeb, potentially LTD, uh, and uh, with uh, Northwest Natural in terms of them uh, lowering their carbon content of their fuel. Uh, so I'm really, that would turn to Mike McCann. Yeah. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, so I'm Michael McCann. I'm uh, the electric generation manager here at eWeb, and uh, my responsibilities for the utility are, uh, are the electric generation that we own. So we have about 150 megawatts of hydroelectricity and about 20 uh, megawatts of wind capacity. And help us meet some of the uh, challenges in attaining the clean energy future that we need as a society. And because we believe hydrogen is an important component in building a resilient utility infrastructure here in the Pacific Northwest. I'll touch briefly on these topics. So as a utility that both produces electricity and buys and sells power on the wholesale, power on the wholesale market, we find ourselves at times with an oversupply of low cost, carbon free green energy. We're not unique. This happens periodically, especially in the springtime in the Northwest. And there's an excess of solar, wind and hydropower in our region. Wholesale power transacts on the spot market, 
in our region. Wholesale power transacts on the spot market, so when supply exceeds demand, to your point, the price goes to zero or in some cases negative. We can't give the stuff away. <laughs> when this happens, dispatchable generation is turned off. And that happens all the time in the spring to our wind farms. We turn off our wind, we spill more water. It happens all the time in the spring to our wind farms. We turn off our wind, we spill more water. We're giving up clean energy. At other times in the year, typically midwinter for heating loads and summer cooling loads, demand exceeds supply and all available resources are generating electricity. Sometimes even that isn't enough and we import electricity into our region. Sometimes even that isn't enough and we import electricity into our region, largely from coal and from other hydrocarbon intensive resources to the east of us. It's not uncommon in the Northwest, for instance, to have very little solar, very little wind, or very little hydropower when we have our typical winter cold snap and we can go set without renewable energy to support the, the load for that, um, for that cold snap. For electricity then, particularly carbon-free electricity, the challenge becomes one of oversupply in the spring and early summer and undersupply or deficit in late summer and midwinter. We need to find a way to capture the excess and save it for when we need it. The answer, not the solar and battery type storage, which are great for the day, for the next day, um, but we need uh, energy that we can store when, for weeks when the wind doesn't blow or um, uh, when we have a cold snap and we can use that energy, we can store energy and use it for when we need it. What we need is energy storage that can bridge across the seas and can do that, right? Hydrogen or ammonia. In fact, it's already being done in Europe and other places around the globe. So imagine if we had an electrolyzer taking price and environmental signals from the electricity market. When the price calls for it, clean energy is plentiful and we generate hydrogen. At other times when prices are higher and clean energy is high mode and we're feeding the grid. From a generation standpoint then, our, gen our renewable resources are now being utilized to their full extent. The hydrogen we've just produced can then be used in the natural gas system. It can be used as a transportation fuel. It can be used as industrial feedstock to make fertilizer, for instance. It can to make fertilizer, for instance. It can also be stored for future use, either with natural gas or by itself, to help us address winter heating or summer cooling peaks when capacity might be an issue. And it can be turned back into electricity if we so desire. From an energy standpoint, that's where we see the important value in renewable or From an energy standpoint, that's where we see the important value in renewable or green hydrogen. We're converting available renewable energy into another form, hydrogen, which can be used to decarbonize other sectors or stored for later use uh, to displace carbon intensive resources. Okay, I wanna to touch a little bit um, on, and switch gears on. There's been a lot of focus and effort um, over the past five years to prepare our region for the inevitable Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. Well, it might be Cascadia, <clears throat> it might be a solar flare, it might be a cyber attack, something. Someday our power and water systems are gonna be challenged. EWEB's water system operates as a pump and store. Our electricity system gets 70% of our power from Bonneville over transmission lines that run through the region. Following a large scale regional event, the Southern Willamette Valley might find itself isolated and on its own for a period of weeks to months. And we have to actively engage in preparing as best we can for when our system will be tested. We believe hydrogen, hydrogen fuel cells can operate water pump stations and emergency drinking water sources. They can also help black start a localized electric grid and help stabilize that grid while we bring on critical loads like police, fire, and hospitals. Finally, because fuel cells are roughly twice as efficient as internal combustion engines, fuel periods of time without refueling than standard emergency generators. This is particularly important should the petroleum transportation sector get disrupted. So we're not there yet. We are including hydrogen in our planning for resiliency and, um, and we, uh, we look forward to including as part of our system. So thank you again, Congressman, for helping. Great. Uh, Daryl Smith uh, from uh, Hydrostar with the electrolyzer, which is right out there. How do you turn this guy on? I think it's, it should be on. Okay. okay. All right. We're all live all the time. Oh, great. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for this opportunity and uh, uh, for the chance to be here. My name is Daryl Smith. I'm with Hydrostar U.S. Technology uh, here in Estacada, Oregon. Um, and I want to talk a little bit, of, in perfect segue, I couldn't have asked for anything better in terms of uh, uh, setting up the stage for things, and I'll actually hit on some of the same points you will. 
Hydrogen is an, an incredibly versatile option for energy storage, and um, it is the most abundant uh, versatile option for energy storage, and um, it is the most abundant uh, uh, element in the universe, so it's not like we'll run out of hydrogen at any anytime soon. Uh, it's uh, typically combined with other things, so hydrogen doesn't exist on its own, so you have to find a way to to make it uh, or to on its own, so you have to find a way to to make it uh, or to create it. And it takes energy, and that's where renewable sources and, and uh, back-of-the-clock options uh, come in play for creating hydrogen. Uh, water is, is uh, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. So in electrolysis, what we do is we basically parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. So in electrolysis, what we do is we basically put DC power on either side of that molecule, and we break it apart um, and, or crack it, as, as you would say. Uh, and that get, in that process, we're taking a liquid and we're creating two gases, hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, with, in fact, the, the expanding renewables, there's, which are intermittent power. So you've got a, a real challenge in trying to manage uh, grid applications as well as uh, long-term storage issues and that sort of thing. So the need for storage is real, and uh, hydrogen is one of those most flexible um, through a fuel cell or a turbine, or as technologies evolve, there'll be more and more options there. Uh, not exactly the highest and best use, but a, a, a ideal use, in, especially in emergency situations or when you have to you know, balance a grid and, and it, it's necessary. Uh, hydrogen uh, fuel cells um, for vehicle uh, refueling, uh, and I, uh, there's obviously an inf infrastructure system that needs to be built. California's working on that. If we, that goes up to the I-5 core, perfect options. Uh, industrial processes use hydrogen uh, frequently. I, I came f uh, for a long time in the glass industry, and uh, we used hydrogen with uh, nitrogen as a cover gas. So does the steel industry for other elements. Uh, hydrogen into the gas pipeline uh, also, and Europe is doing a lot of this. Um, one of my favorites is, and you know, I'll tell you why in a second, is hydrogen to ammonia. And actually, most of the hydrogen that's produced, which is unfortunately done from fossil fuels, goes into the manufacturing of ammonia. Uh, so with ammonia, you can use it as a storage uh, fuel, or you can use it as a fertilizer, which is a very flexible option. What we created and what you saw out there was a very simple device. Uh, our focus has always been low-cost hydrogen generation, um, and, and that's the part that, that's been missing, hydrogen generation. Um, and, and that's the part that, that's been missing in the past. Uh, electrolyzers can be very expensive, uh, and you know, the focus has always been towards efficiency. Our focus has always been towards low cost. We are efficient, but we're also very low cost. And our electrolyte is a key part of that because it's, uh, it's uh, non-corrosive and allows us to do some, some pretty cool things. Uh, as, but as electrolyzers scale, and they are scaling, uh, we're, we're, we're the small guys around. There's, there's some very good technologies out there, uh, Nell, Hydrogenics, ITM, et cetera, that are already doing some great things in terms of building some, some very sizable uh, plants. And uh, that's going to be a, a real key component. I think, uh, as I mentioned uh, in, in our conversation, it's, you know, to me, it's a tool bag. You need to be able to find the right tools for the right application. We have a DOE project that we're working on right now, which is uh, from the uh, solar energy storage element of Department of Energy. Jen, we are creating the, I'm sorry, we're taking excess solar. We're creating the hydrogen, and we're supplying that to a partner's um, rapid ramp ammonia generation system. So that whole system can then follow the available energy. And in this case, because we can directly connect to solar, you know, we're, that's an ideal aspect for us. So phase one right now, we're doing the up and running sometime probably January or so. And uh, phase two will be scaling to one megawatt size scale. The key issue in, in, in getting hydrogen into um, especially the, the electrical power industry, is the cost. And so that's why we focused on that. Um, planning a resource document identified that as one of, the, one of the challenges, one of the features that needs to be addressed. And that's what we've tried to address uh, at Hydrostar. So with respect to, and it gets back to some of your comments with, on the, um, you know, the, the low cost power. What we, the system we're creating on the DOE project focuses on um, input, but we're also looking at using 
the, the overnight low cost uh, power as an option. And our, our analysis so far, and we'll be breaking that down into more and more detail, is that if power is available at two cents per kilowatt hour, that's, uh, that's a value. That's another piece that we can add to the generation of hydrogen and we can add to the generation of hydrogen and in this case ammonia as well. So uh, any questions I'd be glad to answer. And I, again, thank you very much for this opportunity to be here. Okay, uh, and so we'll go to Kim Hiding. Hi, thanks for allowing us to be here. Uh, I head up operations at Northwest Natural, a little bit of context. I head up operations at Northwest Natural, a little bit of context, uh, as you may know. Uh, we serve about 2 million people in 140 communities in the Pacific Northwest. And one of the things that we've been uh, undertaking is a real focused look at how do we leverage the assets we have in place. We have one of the newest, tightest distribution. How do we leverage the assets we have in place? We have one of the newest, tightest distribution systems in the country. How do we put those assets to use in new ways to help our economy decarbonize? <coughs> And we've identified several opportunities. You know, one of them is by closing the loop on waste. So taking the waste streams that would otherwise be emitting by closing the loop on waste. So taking the waste streams that would otherwise be emitting uh, and capturing those and creating renewable natural gas through our pipeline system. But of course, the other one is why we're here today. It's uh, taking that excess renewable energy and, and creating uh, renewable hydrogen and basically turning that into a zero uh, to, our, to our customers. So w one of the things, it's really a pleasure to be here with Oregon State University and our colleagues at eWeb. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a great opportunity to sponsor uh, Professor Chris Hagen's um, students in an international power to gas design competition. And uh, out of, they ranked third, and that alone is, I think, a testament to the talent. But probably more importantly, that project helped begin the discussion about some of the hard questions we need to take a look at when we're considering how do we blend in this new renewable energy source into our existing system. Things like where in the pipeline system, operational considerations as we evolve to serving renewable energy to our, to our communities. So one of the things I'm really excited about is that we have an opportunity to partner with eWeb and Oregon State on a two megawatt power to gas pilot project right here in Eugene. It would be the first of its kind in the country. Uh, taking that oversupply of renewable electricity uh, that, that um, Mike had talked about from eWeb and then integrating it into our pipeline system. So basically taking that renewable electricity and converting it to zero carbon gas so that we can then serve it to homes and businesses. The third component of the project gas so that we can then serve it to homes and businesses. The third component of the project is to take some of that hydrogen and then fuel a zero uh, carbon fuel cell vehicle. So it's really exciting. It's ex exciting to be, uh, I think, partnering with these really smart and committed organizations. And I think part of it is uh, the in committed organizations. And I think part of it is uh, the innovation of looking at two energy systems and trying to figure out how do we leverage the, the capabilities and the benefits of those systems in new ways to really address the climate imperative that we're all facing. So I know it on behalf of all of us at Northwest Natural, we're over to Chris to talk more about the project. Thank you, Kim. Um, hello, Congressman. <clears throat> I'm uh, Chris Hagen. I'm the director of the uh, Energy Systems Lab at Oregon State University in Bend, Oregon. Um, First off, I want to thank Northwest Natural for their support over the last couple of years. Um, they've been great partners with them, and we're looking forward to helping decarbonize or defossilize, like you said, uh, their fuel. But you know, one of the things on top of being very collaborative, you know, that I appreciate about Northwest Natural is their modern modern piping system, and their storage system gives us a lot of options when we're looking at what we might want to do for the future. Um, as background, uh, my lab DOE research over the last uh, seven years, um, everything from natural gas to this renewable hydrogen. Um, and uh, right now we're uh, uh, waited with bated, bated breath to find out about our renewal um, proposal with Northwest Natural, um, where we will be doing a digital twin. Um, so, so basically we'll create a physics-based virtual model um, of all the components and the interconnections within the system. So we said electrolyzer, um, the piping network, um, the re curtail renewables coming out of the gorge, of uh, the storage, and um, create that virtually based on first principles in physics. Um, and, 
and um, create that virtually based on first principles in physics, um, and they use machine learning to um, teach the model uh, to behave more and more like our system, um, utilizing the uh, supercluster in Corvallis. And, um, and first, it will be used to um, inform and forecast um, how um, inform and forecast um, how each one of the stakeholders here should be running their equipment. And the hope is down the road, as the as the model learns and becomes better, we actually can use it for controlling individual components and um, optimizing um, both the technical and the economic operation of all the components that we're talking about today. Great. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Congressman, his staff, EWEB, and all of our members and partners in the room for allowing us the opportunity to share the transportation perspective. Um, some of those members include Toyota, EWEB, Northwest Natural. Our One of our board members, Gary, is the very innovative fleet. We, my name is Michael Graham. Uh, excuse me. My name is Michael Graham. I'm the Director of Policy and Communications here at the Columbia Willamette Clean Cities Coalition. We are a uh, 501c3 nonprofit as well as a U.S. Department of Energy program and a public-private partnership with public and private fleets throughout Oregon and southwest Washington support the nation's energy and economic security goals uh, by building those partnerships so that we can advance affordable domestic transportation fuels, technologies, and practices. Uh, we help our public and private fleet members adopt alternative fuel or vehicle efficiency improvements throughout Oregon and Washington. And in 2018, their Washington and in 2018, their combined efforts uh, displaced the equivalent of 34 and a half million gallons of gasoline. Uh, they prevented the emission of 320,000 pounds of nitrous oxides as well as 257,000 tons of greenhouse gases. So. For over 25 years, we've been leveraging education, information, and our gases. So, for over 25 years, we've been leveraging education, information, and our extensive stakeholder network to move the needle by um, helping folks throughout this region implement and facilitate solutions uh, that revolve around alternative fuels and reducing uh, petroleum consumption. Uh, and I wanted to start, and I wanted to start with just a quick a quick fact. So. In talking with many transit agencies across the West Coast, we participate in the um, US EPA's Alternative Fuel Infrastructure Coordinating Committee, and we help put the dots on the map for where alternative fuels, ranging from compressed natural gas, ele electric, and especially hydrogen now, um, we put those dots on the map, provide them cost estimates for where those should go, and also you know where to best situate those. And in talking with some transit agencies in California, uh, one in particular stated that um, electric vehicles are amazing. However, they only will be able to electrify without charging, which is fairly expensive. Hydrogen is perhaps the best complement right now for these electric uh, transit agencies to supplement the, that gap. And um, it's, being, it's happening now in California, and um, Oregon folks are also very interested. And um, one of the key drivers in California, the very high um, per kilogram uh, hydrogen fuel in California, the low end of the spectrum is about $12 per kilogram, and the high end of the spectrum is about $16. And um, those programs help to reduce uh, hydrogen fuel costs by about $5.5 in California, and uh, by about... Uh, so heavy-duty vehicles will help drive that reduction in costs per kilogram because of their amount of fuel that they will consume, that volume. And folks such as Dave and Toyota will help drive down the component costs of uh, hydrogen vehicles with the economies of scale of light duty vehicles, as well as your Ken Amazing. And I love watching a Kenmore truck pull a trailer full of Toyota Mirais. <laughs> so thanks again for the opportunity, and uh, we're happy to share our perspective. Great. Great. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Dave Bora from Toyota. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Dave Bora. I'm from Toyota Motor North America. And thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Dave Bora. I'm from Toyota Motor North America. And um, I'm in the Advanced Technology Research Department. And uh, we're very excited about hydrogen and fuel cell. And, and um, this, this is a great turnout. Um, so thanks, thanks, everyone, also, for being here. Globally, Toyota has, uh, globally, Toyota has uh, some environmental goals that they've established. And by 2025, they've moved it up from 2020, 2030. They've accelerated by five years. So half of the vehicles that we sell globally are going to be electrified. Hmm. So what I mean by electrified, so that means um, 
So what I mean by electrified, so it means um, it will be hybrid electric vehicles like our Prius right now, or plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, which is uh, like our Prius Prime, and battery electric vehicles, and then also the fuel cell electric vehicles, just like the Mirai that's, that's uh, parked right outside here. Mirai that's, that's uh, parked right outside here. And Toyota just announced that uh, they're going to be increasing their fuel cell stack production by tenfold. So right now we produce uh, 3,000 fuel cell stacks a year. That's going to go to 30,000 fuel cell stacks. Toyota also produces 3,000 fuel cell stacks. Toyota also produces the hydrogen tanks that go in the vehicles. So they're building right now the facilities that will um, start producing the fuel cell stacks and the hydrogen tanks. So by the end of 2020, those facilities will be up and running and they'll be doing 30,000 fuel cell stacks um, a year. Fuel stacks um, a year. So Toyota is also a big sponsor of the 2020 Olympics, which are gonna be in Tokyo. And uh, as you're watching the games, you'll probably see a lot of uh, hydrogen-related vehicles moving the athletes and people around. Uh, Toyota's building 100 fuel cell electric buses it's called the Toyota next year is going to be producing uh, Toyota forklifts, fuel cell forklifts. And their plan is to sell 500 in 2020. So those will also be utilized at the, at the Olympic Games. Um, and more recently in, uh, in the United States, Toyota was excited to announce a uh, collaboration with Kenworth. So we take two of those and we put them in a Class 8 heavy-duty semi. And so it's zero emissions. And right now with Kenworth, we're building 10 uh, heavy-duty trucks, and um, those are going to be operating out of drayage operations out of the port of LA, and so operations out of the port of LA, and so uh, there was a grant from CARB, California Air Resources Board, of 41 million dollars to help build those trucks, and also there's going to be some tractors and cargo equipment, cargo moving equipment, and also the hydrogen infrastructure. They're going to they're going to have a carbonate fuel cell that they're going to they're going to have a carbonate fuel cell that's going to produce 2.35 megawatts electricity, one ton of, of hydrogen uh, a day that will fuel the trucks and provide electricity for all of the uh, logistics operations down there at the port. So four four of the trucks will be utilized by Toyota logistics operations, utilized by Toyota logistics operations to move vehicles around from the port to dealerships. Three of the trucks will be utilized by UPS, so they're going to have zero emissions delivering their, their packages. And then um, the other three are some, a couple other transport companies. And um, more on the line of, of the Mirai. So right now, um, the Mirai is on sale in California, and we have about 5,700 of them that have been sold since 2015. And, uh, they're, they're great cars. Both of my sisters drive them. They live down there, and uh, they, they love being able to afford them, so that's kind of cool. But the other, the other advantage is that uh, it's only a three- to five-minute refueling. So it's not an overnight charge or, you know, hours of charging or recharging a battery. It's just like filling your, you know, gasoline in your internal combustion car. So it's a real quick refill. 312-mile <laughs> range, so very, very emissions. The only emissions is water, and so it's actually... <laughs> Mirai uh, emissions right here that uh, comes out of the back of the Mirai there. So, yeah, we're really excited about uh, the future regarding hydrogen, and we're uh, excited about trying to develop it in the Northwest, and we're happy to be here. Thanks for, thanks for the invitation, and we're happy to be here. Thanks for, thanks for the invitation. Great. Excellent. Okay. And then finally, uh, Ken Dragoon uh, from the Renewable Hydrogen Alliance. Thank you, Congressman. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for doing this. Uh, it's very exciting. Um, I represent, I'm the executive director of the Hydrogen Alliance. If anyone wants to know more about the organization, there are these brochures over there on the table. We also have this publication, uh, one sheet sort of explaining uh, why hydrogen, what we're doing. Um, you might wonder why this why now universe uh, it's the first thing that they created that was created after the subatomic particles um, and let me tell you so wind and solar are now the lowest cost source of electricity in much of the country and much of the world today 
Well, let me repeat that. Wind and solar power is now the least cost source of electricity in much of the country and much of the world today. This is really revolutionary. It's a revolution. We've seen a revolution in my lifetime. I've been happy to be able to see that. The revolution is over, be able to see that. The revolution is over in the sense that we're there. <laughs> it's been a while in coming. It, it, it seemed impossible to me personally, but it's here. It's irreversible. We're not going back. But it's really only just begun in terms of application and ramifications. It's only just begun in terms of application and ramifications. We do have solar projects going up. It's actually, I think, slowed a little bit in the last year or so, which is the wrong direction. We need to be accelerating everything. Um, but the ramifications also um, aren't being the ramifications also um, aren't being seen yet. Uh, we know about the variability of uh, wind and solar and, and how to deal with that. We tend to focus uh, popularly on when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, but actually probably the more interesting opportunity is the opposite of that and, and about when prices go low, what do we do? Well, this is something we can do. This is one of the ramifications, the ability to make climate neutral clean fuels from renewable electricity and what? Water. Um, ultimately, the water could even be seawater uh, without limit. Um, sources that's made this possible. That's why we're talking about this today. But also, um, what's happened is that the low cost means that you can make these fuels. The devices themselves, the electrolyzers, uh, as Daryl was talking about, are still kind of expensive because they're kind of a new thing. Well, they're not really new. <laughs> this is a, not a new technology, but the economies of scale of manufacturing them is new. And it's because of the progress being made, the deployments of these uh, devices in Europe that have brought the cost down to where they are today. The costs, to be clear, have dropped by a factor of two in just two or three years. In production levels, um, higher manufacturing um, uh, levels, and larger manufacturing sites, mostly in Europe today, um, are going to drop the costs m more. And um, they'll be less than half of what they are today in the next few years. They are today in the next few years. If, if what? If we invest in it. We need to invest in this. It's being done in Europe, and we can wait. We can sit on our hands and, and wait to the Europeans do the job for us, or we can accelerate. We can accelerate by investing here. We need the kinds of accelerate. We can accelerate by investing here. We need the kinds of incentives that drove down the cost of wind and solar. Look what's happened to wind and solar. They were by far the highest cost resources. Now they're the lowest cost. And thanks to China and Germany, largely, the investing in this, the investment that we need now is so technical, technological breakthroughs will likely come. What we need are investments. We need things like um, infrastructure tax credits that we saw for, for wind and solar projects. We need renewable standards for, for example, the gas system, similar to what Northwest Imagine of what happens. Right now, the Northwest, and uh, other than the few electric vehicles we have, all of our fuels come from outside the region. Billions of dollars uh, come, uh, go outside the region every year to literally go in holes in the ground. What if that investment stayed here, fuels locally? The issue of resilience uh, came up, and uh, this is a part of that. All right, great jobs, but also clean air. These hydrogen vehicles, uh, there they're are hydrogen buses and trains today. There are ships being built uh, in, in San Francisco, uh, hydrogen aircraft. Hydrogen is one thing, but as uh, Daryl said, you can make it into ammonia. You can actually make it into methane, which is the primary component of natural gas, and we can do it without limit. The future is there, it's really here, and it's now, and it's not particularly controversial in, into methane, which is the primary component of natural gas, and we can do it without limit. 
the future is there, it's really here, and it's now, and it's not particularly controversial. In Washington State, we passed a bill uh, with Douglas County PUD had sponsored. It came up, it was initiated by really controversial. In Washington State, we passed a bill uh, with Douglas County PUD had sponsored. It came up, it was initiated by a Republican senator on the east side of the mountains. It was signed into law by a Democratic governor running for president, and it passed both houses of the leg. Good for everyone. It's not controversial, but it will take an investment. It's not even a huge investment in the scale of things, a uh, billion dollars nationwide of, of, of maybe 50 to $100 million here in, in the Northwest or in Oregon anyway. The thing is we need to do it. We need to do it now. The climate won't wait. The roads will be quieter. Thank you. Well, thanks. Uh, I think that's, uh, I mean, this is a very exciting uh, prospect and, uh, you know, we look forward. I, I would like to talk to you more about you, your number. It seems like a very modest number to me. If that's uh, all we would need federally, it seems like how we can encourage it. I have one, one question. You, you know, we produce both hydrogen and oxygen, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Uh, that was, I, and just reminded me that part of the, ec the economics were different when Jack first proposed this. They were more difficult uh, in terms of the production. But he also said there was a big market for, for pure uh, oxygen. Oxygen. Uh, oxygen. oxygen. Yes. So that that was also a commodity that could be sold. It, it could be. And, and generally, when we do our market analysis, that doesn't necessarily factor into it. But it's another component that could be added into analysis of the total market and what the opportunities are. Yes. Yeah. He, he specifically, at the time, I remember mentioned Intel used a vast amount of, yeah. of, of yeah. pure yeah. At the time, I remember mentioned Intel used a vast amount of, yeah. of, yeah. of yeah. pure yeah, oxygen. Same thing to me. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so true. That, that's, that's exciting. There's actually a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, industrial applications mm -hmm. that do require uh, pure oxygen source. Yeah. yeah. So uh, even improving the economic prospects more Absolutely. for doing this. And uh, I, I, Kim, you were talking about, uh, and we're talking about you're going to model the how you might uh, put a renewable, you know, or you know, hydrogen into the. I read, you know, my 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 committee doesn't have jurisdiction over siting pipelines it doesn't have jurisdiction over what goes into a pipeline but we have jurisdiction safety issue is leaks and we're talking about having a very tight system but we're finding out nationally we have a very leaky system which is you know wasting gas and creating you know uh, you know uh, fossil fuel pollution but as I was reading up on putting hydrogen in I don't know the answer there's like but for lower vapor pressure and it's and it would even require a tighter system as you mix it in, is that? Well, um, so we've been working with Northwest Natural for the last year on that exact uh, situation. Actually, we're doing it right now as I speak, right? So we, um, from their direction, we are doing leak tests in my laboratory right now um, to prove or disprove this. That it's, um, and you have all these kind of diffusion concerns. Um, at the levels that we're talking about, you know, single digit percentage um, by volume, um, it's not a huge issue, but it's one we want to get out ahead of. Um, and so we are, we're running those tests right now just to kind of get some real empirical data on, on what to be concerned about. And was that, I also think I read something, about, I also think I read something about, something about brittleization, which could be a result of hydrogen through, yeah. Well, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, it's, it's one of the things that, again, Europe is ahead of us on. Um, there are uh, many projects, I think about 30 projects across Europe, where they're doing power to gas. Uh, many projects, I think about 30 projects across Europe, where they're doing power to gas, and they're blending it into the pipeline system. And it varies the percentages that they're blending from 5 to 10 percent. They're now testing a 20 percent hydrogen blend, and they're doing all of that work. There's also uh, some exciting projects where there's where they're building brand new systems that are built to just um, deliver hydrogen and so I think there is a lot of opportunity I mean there's there's different uh, utilities across the country we're all looking at this issue obviously safety is the number one priority and we have to we have to make sure all of those standards are are well understood and to make sure everybody's comfortable but it's absolutely something that we believe is possible and and actually eminent if you if you look at what's happening in Europe I think they have um, 
come to the realization, I was talking to somebody around the table, particularly in Germany, that they're getting very serious about hydrogen. They're getting serious about, uh, about hydrogen. They're getting serious about uh, hydrogen from renewables, but also hydrogen from gas with carbon capture and sequestration because they see how difficult uh, it's going to be to decarbonize buildings, for example. And so I think, um, to Ken's point, we have to start asking and answering those questions now. Um, to Ken's point, we have to start asking and answering those questions now, and there are answers for those questions. There is technology, leak detection technology that's constantly being improved and innovated on that we can address those issues and we can achieve the goal, but we've got to get started. All right. Anybody else here want to contribute any other thoughts on, on the issue? I mean, that's very exciting. Uh, if not, I might turn. I don't know how much time we have. My staff never... Okay, we could see if anybody in the audience has a question. Well, Congressman, can I okay. say something first? So um, one of the things that got us happening in Europe, they're putting electrolyzers at the wind farms. So they're taking direct signals from the wind farms, generating hydrogen, and then doing something there. Our wind farm is in the Columbia Gorge, right? It's not, it's not in Eugene. But we in the Northwest are lucky to have um, the power uh, in our system is so cheap compared to other places in the uh, in our system is so cheap compared to other places in the country in the world that we can get the, the price signal right uh, at certain times of the year on the wholesale market to generate we can, we can make it work economically to generate hydrogen here in Eugene from where we sit we have a 24/7 trading floor um, in that building right across the the 24/7 trading floor um, in that building right across the the breezeway. And, and based on the price signals, we can generate hydrogen when it makes sense to. We can beat what USDOE put in their price point study. Our problem right now is the capital expense, so finding someone to uh, invest in the capital expense. Can I echo that for a second? Yes. Uh, most of the organizations around the table are members of, of ours. One of our international members uh, told me the other day that they were a member of a group in New York, and when they were considering joining our organization, his boss told him, well, you know, you're going to have to give up some of us because the opportunities here are so enticing that uh, there are probably half a dozen projects under development now, at least two H2 at scale applications in from members of our organization here in the Northwest. Uh, and it is because of what Mike said. We have a huge abundance of renewable, loss of what Mike said. We have a huge abundance of renewable low-cost power. So this is a huge opportunity nationwide, worldwide, but it makes sense for it to be starting here. Mm -hmm. right. So um, go ahead. Oh, just real quick, Congressman. Um, so you mentioned, uh, you know, you have some of the, some background on, uh, you know, you have some of the, some background on um, the hydrogen issues and potential uh, like embrittlements. And I want to mention that um, I think one of the things with with modern kind of utilities like Northwest Natural, you know, their pipes are coated and are, are made of non-carbon, you know, at times or whatever. So the embrittlement actually isn't as big of an issue local utilities and is like the, the big pipeline and trying to go long distances. So I just thought mm -hmm. I'd mention that. Yeah. yeah, Congressman, I was just going to add that... Uh, turn the mic toward him. Yeah. There. Yeah. So, Congressman, I was going to add that one of the issues that uh, we are facing in the West, and it's not just the Northwest, to instantly go to the generation piece, which is solar, wind, hydro. One of the challenges that we're facing when we look at further electrification, whether it be vehicles or buildings, is the transmission system. Getting energy from one point to another, and it's often overlooked because people instantly go to the sun or the wind. And so we're embarking on a number of studies over the next year in the Northwest where we're not just gonna look at generation capacity or resource adequacy from a generation perspective, but also how do we optimize getting energy from one point to another? And in the long term, various forms of energy are gonna be required to do that, including hydrogen. Jen. Yeah, well, I mean, we had, I, I think back during the uh, early days of the Obama administration, discussion about a smart grid, and I don't think, you know, we ever quite got to the point of defining exactly what the smart grid would be and how, how it might function uh, differently than what we have today. And, uh, and then I know the BPA, you know, how they serve the wind farms and how that gets onto their uh, high voltage uh, lines and 
you know, controversy over when or how BPA might ask them to power down the, the wind generation. And I mean, it seems like hydrogen could play a key role in a lot of these problem points. Yeah. I'd also add that uh, upgrading the grid uh, would also bring another benefit to the Pacific Northwest, especially, which should be resilience. And since most of our electric grid was fortunately, unfortunately, built back in, you know, the earlier times, uh, it wasn't built to seismic codes. Back in, you know, the earlier times, uh, it wasn't built to seismic codes. Is there any new technology and transmission and less loss over longer distances? Is that your area of expertise? or um, Not specifically, no. I mean, and the smart grid is still being worked on, but that is kind of what we're – not specifically, no. I mean, and the smart grid is still being worked on, but that is kind of what we're talking about here is making this more intelligent and including the pipe, you know, pipelines as part of this kind of energy sharing situation. Yeah. Anybody else want to contribute? Okay. Anybody in the audience have a question? Yes, go ahead. Identify yourself. Yeah, I'm Alex. Go ahead. Um, I had a question. Identify yourself. Yeah, I'm Alex Tyler. I'm uh, with Lane County. Um, I had a question for Michael um, or Dave. I've got a friend who um, is an agronomist down in California, and she is working on uh, cleaned up methane into pipelines. But she said, you know, there's a brand new program funded through their cap and trade legislation. I'm assuming the programs that you two mentioned in California would not be there but for the cap-and-trade um, revenue generation, is that, but the, also the cap-and-trade program. You mentioned the um, uh, money from, is it CARP, California Air Resources? CARP, yeah. Correct, yeah. CARP. yeah. yeah. And um, Michael, you mentioned another funding source, and I just, like I said, I just wondered if that money came out of are you saying it came out of the low carbon fuel standard or came There out of are both a cap and trade system and a low carbon fuel standard. Oregon has a similar program called the clean fuel standard. It's almost nearly identical, functions the same way where a market was set up and managed by the state so that lower carbon fuels can be incentivized. The price per carbon is quite high in California and Oregon's market is carbon fuels can be incentivized. The Price per carbon is quite high in California, and Oregon's market is also getting higher, and that's, that benefits the end users for certain fuels and the users in certain fuels um, that are producing those lower carbon, largely renewable fuels. Um, the cap and trade is separate. Cap and trade is separate. It, but I will say that in California, they have what's called an HVIP. It's a VIP, it's a voucher program that can be used to uh, offset the cost, excuse me, the cost of, uh, of low carbon, low emission, zero emission vehicles. Natural gas is included, um, hydrogen, electric, so funding for infrastructure under that with certain criteria. Um, for example, an electric yard truck that costs about $325,000 can receive a voucher for $150,000, and that program specifically is funded by the cap and trade. I'm so sorry, my back's to you. <laughs> Yeah, the, the state of California has really the hydrogen in fueling infrastructure, and they've they've earmarked 200 million to help that build that infrastructure, uh, 20 million dollars a year for the fueling stations. I'm, I might just mention there there is a new legislation that just got passed here in Oregon uh, for renewable natural gas. Uh, allows um, which includes renewable hydrogen, and it's the first kind of legislation in the country. We're really excited about it. There's a rulemaking that's going to begin, and we're hoping that obviously we'll have some flexibility to be pursuing uh, renewable hydrogen under that bill. Another, and of course, I, I, MWMC probably isn't here. I mean, you know, we uh, in taking testimony earlier this year in my committee, we had a, a metropolitan authority in New Jersey. Uh, who had had to substantially, you know, upgrade and rebuild their system, and they built in a methane capture system. And uh, in the end, they are they're free of drawing energy, obviously putting energy onto the grid. And thanks to a zero interest or very low interest loan, they didn't even have to increase uh, sewer rates. So I, I'm not sure if MWMC is looking at things like that or not. Are they? Okay. Yeah, the program, the, uh, um, the state revolving 
Right. I'm, yeah, the state revolving funds uh, program has been reauthorized since 87. I'm working on the first reauthorization since 87. They've only allowed a reauthorization since 87. They've only allowed a pilot program for uh, methane capture through the appropriations process. I want to make it permanent and I want to give it a much larger percentage allocation under the fund uh, to allow, uh, you know, other authorities or, or like uh, like MWMC and others to your authorities or, or like uh, like MWMC and others to uh, endeavor to capture the methane and uh, you know actually save money. So, so we do have a project right now, an exciting project uh, in, in partnership with Northwest Natural to uh, purify our biogas and inject it into Northwest Natural gas and inject it into Northwest Natural pipeline, right. which I think you're yeah. Is that, uh, is that just an osmotic process, or how do you do that? Um, you, it's a process, in our particular case, it uses pressure swing absorption. Yeah. But there's a number of technologies that um, are, of course, technologies that um, are applicable to uh, removing the carbon dioxide, which is the, the main um, mm -hmm. thing you need to get out. And, uh, and, and that means we'll have a stream of carbon dioxide, and so, as well, that we're just going to transfer the methane, which is like, you know, chemically identical to the Northwest Natural product, will be injected into the, the pipeline, and that's happening here in Eugene. Right. Um, it's also happening up in Portland metro area. So Oregon has two wastewater facilities at this point that are moving forward with, the, with that. And what it does for us is it allows us. Great. Congratulations on that. Yes. Um, Alan Zalink, Assistant Director of Oregon Park and Energy. On that same topic, Along with Northwest Natural Gas and, and MWMC, the Oregon Farm Energy created a renewable natural gas inventory, RG inventory, surveyed all the different fuel sources in the state. And now we're shifting into the economics of each of those supply lines. The big stumbling area seems to be, uh, the barrier seems to be capital investment into these different uh, infrastructure areas to be able to convert to well, I, you know, like I say, I'm working on my committee on uh, things that would relate to uh, uh, wastewater. Uh, you know, that would be a standard that, or that would probably come out of energy and commerce, but I'd be interested in any, I mean, what you've seen from your agency's perspective, what you've seen from your agency's perspective in terms of what kind of targeted investments we would need, and be happy to have a, you know, have a conversation about that and see if I can come up with something. I don't. I can introduce bills that don't go to my committee and try and move energy and commerce or somebody else or ways and means. Maybe it might be it, depending. For residential. Oh. Right. Yeah, our, uh, the report was actually, I think, uh, nearly 50 billion cubic feet of technical potential. So, um, and and the Oregon residential gas use in the state. So there's there's wow. certainly enough to matter, and we're happy to be trying to go after it. Okay, Alan. Yeah, I want to put you in touch, and, and we'll follow up on that. So, yep. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm Shannon Betcher from University of Oregon. I'm a chemistry professor working on a lot of basic science aspects of this. And one of the things I've wondered, so I'm working on a lot of basic science aspects of this, and one of the things I've wondered, so it seems like the business case for electrolysis coupled to excess electricity from renewables is starting to get pretty good. So I'm curious, like, how far are we from the private equity markets making the investment? I mean, so it sounds like if we really need federal or state level money, so money, so so, like, where is the gap there? Why is that? I mean, so the infrastructure is expensive, capital expenses are big. So, I wonder if the panel could say something to that. Uh, I mean, for us, obviously, the, the, the challenge is uh, capital uh, infusion into the company. We're a small company, and uh, for a small company, and uh, for us, it's also been a developmental cycle, long develop, de developmental cycle. Um, we find that, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of interest in, 
in uh, investing in apps and commercial or com consumer products and such, but there's not a lot of appetite for it. But there's not a lot of appetite for um, when it comes to something that is uh, takes a long, lot longer. And you know, there is some risk involved, of course, in any investment. Um, so, you know, there's anything that can uh, make that uh, uh, more substantial is is obviously important. We've um, we look to this project. We've um, we look to this project we're doing as a key component for us because uh, it allows us to uh, demonstrate a real-world application and, and show the market that there's something there. And we believe that that's going to be a catalyst for bringing more investment into companies like ours, not necessarily just us, but um, not necessarily just us, but um, when, when people start seeing the real, uh, the real applications and see the benefit from it and we can, you know, uh, demonstrate the, the viability of such a project that I think we're going to see more of that. So. And, and part of what we would need would be uh, tax credits. I mean, that's what moved wind along. I mean, that's what moved wind along. I mean, initially wind was quite expensive. And as it became, you know, higher levels of production and better equipment, uh, and we're still fighting over whether we should continue the, the credits. Uh, I'm for continuing the credits because uh, we're dealing with a whole different issue now. We're not just trying to create, we're trying to deal with climate change at the same time. So I think we ought to extend those, but that's not a settled issue with, with Congress. But it seems like this would be another area where they should be applied. I, I would say, you know, with Frank's encouragement, three or four years ago, I went boldly into this hydrogen discussion, and what we found was, at the time, the cap. But I think Daryl mentioned in his comments, you know, over the last two years or so, prices have, have dropped substantially, and they continue to drop. And as this market develops, I think we'll get closer and closer. Tax incentives are going to help us, right? They're going to help us get us over the hump. But we're getting pretty close at this point where we've got folks coming in and wanting to talk to us, knowing that we've been to up their capital to make it happen. So we're, we're really close. Yeah, I think it's going from a push situation to a pull situation, and that's going to be very valuable. It's also just, it's, it's new. Um, I think a lot of the work of, that I've been doing with my organization is spreading the information. So now there are probably half of government support uh, because the economics aren't quite there today. Um, probably half of those or more are because simply I've been talking this up to utilities and to uh, well, electric utilities and gas utilities, but also gas utilities, but also developers. So I have members who are renewable energy developers. They didn't know anything about this. The utility folks, some did know. Northwest Natural and eWeb were aware of hydrogen through electrolysis and had looked at it before. And and I think three utilities looked at it before. And and I think three utilities told me, yeah, we looked at that a couple of years ago and it wasn't going to pencil out. And, and I had to say, yeah, that, that was a couple of years ago. We're getting really close. So there's some inertia in anything that's new. Um, there is the capital cost. So if you, like, if you stand up a hydrogen fueling station in an area where you're hoping for passenger vehicles to show up, <laughs> that's a large capital expense over very few kilograms of hydrogen sold. Um, if you can do a fleet, a fleet or um, a heavy transportation handling, uh, 20,000 forklifts now in operation, and at the ports, they're, they're doing it. So um, if you can get that kind of scale going, uh, then you can spread the capital costs over a lot more things. But that's sort of a chicken and the egg thing. And that's where government support can really help us out. Egg thing, And that's where government support can really help us out. If we get things sort of kindled, <laughs> this will go. So to touch on that, um, it the chicken the egg analogy um, you're going to need to help bridge the gap that is risk and fleet the need to help bridge the gap that is risk and fleets they see these alternative fuels and they're very excited they want to do it but they need someone to help them take over that risk which is you know the capital expense primarily for the fueling infrastructure the vehicles are substantial as well and uh uh, pan out, their procurement officer is going to say, well, you can never buy another hydrogen vehicle again. 
And um, the, the unique thing where there's a lot of crossover right now for hydrogen transportation and electrolysis is electrolysis conveniently produces a zero carbon fuel, which is very valuable if used in a transportation application in Oregon and Washington. So, so it's driving a lot of interest. And the key barriers right now are getting that, that infrastructure in place. And the second one would be the, um, the vehicle conversions or replacements. And what's convenient, though, about electrolysis hydrogen as well, I know there's many conveniences, uh, is that the, in about electrolysis hydrogen as well, I know there's many conveniences, uh, is that the, in many instances, the, the transportation fleets, these return to base fleets, right, where they have a central fueling station like the transit buses, they go out, they run their routes, they come back. A lot of those in California are turning to on-site electrolysis because once they come back, a lot of those in California are turning to on-site electrolysis because it's so expensive to transport the hydrogen, especially compressed. The amount of energy in a tanker full of hydrogen that's compressed is about two and a half percent of that transported in a typical petroleum, you know, gasoline uh, or, uh, over the road. So it's very little, you have to liquefy it. Another very expensive capital expense. But going back to the on-site electrolysis production, that's convenient because if you use CMAC money, which is congestion mitigation, air quality, and air quality um, investment improvement, and that's from FHA, that, those monies can be used to fund not only alternative fuel vehicle retrofits and replacements, but also infrastructure. I don't know if they've ever had an electrolysis application before, it's quite new, but I would, I would think that that would be applicable under that funding. So one nuance though with that, is with that funding are that one, it's oversubscribed and that, that means that, and, and that most of that funding goes to roads and bridges that is you know, used in, by states and MPOs. And that means that alternative fuels and vehicles and infrastructure kind of takes a back seat, but you can still get money through a competitive grant process. The second nuance is that there is a Buy America compliance issue with CMAC, which is, which is uniquely, um, uniquely, it's bad for alternative fuel vehicles and infrastructure because it's impossible to find an, a vehicle that is one America, you know, you have the bolts and every other component in the vehicle has to be 100% made here. That was originally intended for the iron and steel from my understanding for roads and bridges. And I'm not sure where all of the, um, where electrolyzers are made or the fuel cells, but I imagine that not, that they're not 100% American made. So that could be another hang up for CMAC. In terms of yours, do you, is there any imported component? Uh, we use steel and stainless steel, three or four stainless steel and plastic. And the plastic we actually can uh, 3D print here in the United mm -hmm. States uh, or, or injection mold, any number of applications, mm -hmm. or methods, I should say. Uh, do. Um, so we don't import mm -hmm. any components at this point in time. There's sort of two sides of that. If we want to drive the technology and we want to bring the value-added jobs home is some of the intent of the Buy America requirements, but we don't want to exclude. Uh, I just was dealing with uh, offshore wind. Uh, and uh, heavy lift, uh, and the wind people came in and were lobbying against uh, having Jones Act application, U.S. ships, sure. U.S. Yeah. crews, uh, for heavy lift to, uh, to uh, cite them. And what I did is uh, I created a, a process in the bill where I said um, they have to make them, they have to publicize that they're looking to do this. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if there are no, uh, you know, U.S. bidders, uh, then they can use non-Jones Act uh, uh, ships. But my in hope and intent is that the U.S. shipbuilding industry will see a new market, and they will build these, and they will build these uh, heavy lift ships for uh, installing wind turbines in the ocean, and that be the same thing here. I mean. We could give exemptions where the technology doesn't exist, but but say that when the when it does exist, then we're going to up the percentage, and we want to see that the U.S. manufacturers. Then we're going to up the percentage, and we want to see that the U.S. manufacturer. Because I mean, we've lost so much industry, we need to recapture some. And the good news is on CMAC, that's under the authority of my committee, and we're writing the 2020 service transportation bill. And you've just given me something to tell the staff, and I have. 
portable memory units here are taking. <laughs> uh, they will uh, tell my service transportation staff about the issues uh, with uh, CMAC and, and uh, that we can fix that. We can set aside a part of the program for that and say, no, a certain percentage of the program, which needs to be bigger, will go to that. So, Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Uh, thank you all for being here. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.